some extent video output and as we all know video is a very complex system so it is actually when you write an application or you write a driver it's very difficult to know whether your driver or application is actually doing the right thing and this has been a problem for many years and last year i worked hard on uh, actually for the driver compliance testing there has been a tool for quite a long time but last year it was improved uh, in a very big way and for application testing there is a new driver that you can use to test your application and that's basically what this talk is all about um, so for working with video for linux we have a bunch of utilities and this is uh, a quick overview of them first of all ctrl2 compliance that is a utility that tests whether your video for linux driver is actually following the api do you fill in all the structure fields uh, did you miss anything are there certain ioctos that you had to implement and you didn't or vice versa and it is really strict about that and it's an excellent way for testing your driver then we have ctrl2 ctl that is a swiss army command line tool for basically driving video for linux devices so you can query them set things up do streaming do whatever you want it's completely command line you don't need to need any gui uh, fuel ctrl2 is basically ctrl2 ctl but with a gui a huge framework is being used there and that's ideal to do interactive testing and checking what is going on there is a little debug utility that allows you to directly set registers in uh, in your hardware you have to be root to use this of course but it is a nice little front end to do that we have added some core debugging so quite often you're running an application the application doesn't work uh, you want to know okay what what is it telling the driver to do so by you can actually turn on debugging for specific video nodes if you set it to one then it will show all the ioctos that it's calling if you set it to two it will show the arguments given to the ioctos as well that's very useful to figure out okay why is my application working what is what is it trying to do and finally last year we added uh, support to valgrind for ctrl2 so valgrind knows about all the structures that you pass in ioctos a lot of the structures we use they have reserved fields that the application is supposed to set to zero we never had a way to actually check that the application was doing that and with Valgrind, it's now possible if you run it over your application it will tell you hey you forgot to initialize that to zero very very useful to double check that your application is following all the rules we try to keep that up to date um, right now it's up to date to 3.19 that's not even out uh, but to 3.20 we have a slight api addition and i've made a patch to add support for 3.20 already so we really try to keep that up to date it's these tools are pointless if you don't keep them up to date oh. so let's go a bit more into detail for ctrl tools compliance it actually started seven years ago uh, it started out just with this idea hey it should be nice to have a tool and initially it i think it tested three ioctos or something but whenever i had a bit of time or i needed something i've been adding ioctos to it and it is now uh, covering a uh, really big part uh, the main breakthrough was early last year when we added support for streaming so it can also test before that it was just configuration of your video that was tested now it can also start streaming and test whether know when you get the suspect that the everything uh, the buffer related meta information is correct and you know everything works as it should it's very important if you make a new driver it has to pass ctrl2 compliance a few exceptions not certain types of drivers are currently not supported but if it is supported you must pass this compliance test otherwise mm, so I, I when you post the post a new drive i immediately ask what the output of this tool is uh, close to something like 900 tests i think that's probably more than 900 by now are performed um, it's really testing it, it not definitely not 100 percent coverage but i'm really trying to do a really good job here 
Actually, I'm working with someone who is currently fixing a driver to make it fast, and he keeps going through. Every time he fixes one thing and a new one pops up, oh, yes, I need to do that as well. It's I'm sure if you want to get the driver into the kernel, this is a really annoying thing. Um, currently, we have of the 82 IOCTOs, we could cover them all except for seven, and they have to do with stopping and selecting. Actually, not quite true. The, we added some tests for that, but it's not full coverage of it, and some overlay stuff. Important to know, the tool is actually more strict than the specification. Um, because it also checks whether your driver is using all the latest frameworks. Uh, a lot of frameworks that we added, they, for example, controls. Controls are things like brightness and contrast, uh, saturation, lots of other things that you can do with it. We have a framework in the kernel that handles controls. And if you use that, then you get lots of freebies. So all the control-related IOPTOs are all supported, but it, it all that stuff is handled by the framework. If you're not using the framework, then you will have to implement all that yourself. And I guarantee that you won't do a good job of that. So it's really checking that not only do you follow the API, but do you also follow what the framework will give you. So some things that framework will give you for free may be optional in the API, but I still check that. Um, if you need to run this, always compile from the Git repository. It just keeps getting updated regularly. What you get is distributions is always out of date. So always use the latest. And let me give you a quick demo of this. So I have uh, in this laptop, I have a, a webcam, of course, and I can just run FIFA 2 compliant. Let me make this a little bit better. Um, readable in the back. Let me go to this step. So first it gives you uh, some background information. What is the driver? What are the capabilities? What are you? So this GCC video, of course. Uh, for the record, this is a uh, uh, 319 kernel, release candidate 6 with all the latest uh, media uh, patches that go to 3.20. So it's bleeding edge media tool, let's say. And one thing that is important to know is this little line here, not using libp pro 2 A little bit of background. libp pro 2 is a library that does format conversion basically came out lots of webcams, certainly the older ones, they all have proprietary formats. You don't want as application developers to convert from all those proprietary formats to something that you can actually handle. So this library was created that sits in the back and that does the conversion for you. So basically this library is sitting in between what your application is telling the driver and what the driver actually will choose. So the compliance tests by default are going straight to the driver. You can also, by an option, you can also go through libp pro 2 um, But I know that libp pro 2 is doing a few things not quite standardized, so it will give you extra errors. Um, so then now it's going to all the IOPTOs. So it's testing, first of all, this is required. IOPTO is there. Uh, you should be able to handle multiple opens of your device nodes. Uh, debug IOCTOs, testing all the various input-related IOCTOs, uh, tuner, frequencies, uh, audio inputs, video inputs, standard output, configuring timings, uh, and then it's going through all the inputs or outputs that you have in turn, and for each of them check whether it handles things correctly. Now this is a good example where you get a failure, and this is caused so again, this basically comes back to frameworks. Almost all drivers today use the control framework, with one exception, UVC, because UVC is actually it's, it's fairly dynamic. It gets its control information from the hardware instead of hard-coded in the driver. So UVC doesn't use the framework, and this happens to be uh, a new 
extension that was recently added, and EC3 has not been adapted for that. So I'm testing, do you follow the framework? Are you using this new feature? And it will fail in EC3 because that has not been impl implemented yet in that, uh, that driver. So this is one example where, you, where it is very easy to, to check that. Now the, the error messages that you get, they tend to be, sometimes they are really nice and sometimes they are fairly obscure. What you often have to do is go into the source, look up the line number and see exactly what it's trying to do there. It would be great if the messages were completely understandable. If anyone wants to volunteer to fix that, just let them know. Uh, my I concentrated on getting as many tests crammed in as possible. I did not really concentrate all that much on making it nice and human readable and fancy. And yeah, there are only so many hours in a day. So by default, it is the, uh, oh, let me. So it's doing a control check of uh, various formats, whether that is handled correctly. Um, if, if certain IOCTOs are not supported, it will say it's okay, and it will say, hey, it isn't supported. Of course, if this driver would have to support this, if it would be a compulsory IOCTO for this type, then this would fail. But this is just saying, hey, yeah, well, not supported. But that's okay for this one. And you get a nice, uh, summary at the end. Now this is doing just setup configuration. If I add the minus X flag, then it will start streaming as well. And as you can see here too, I don't know why, I, I'm not using C maintainer. Um, I need to tell him that it's failing again. So UBC is a bit of an old one because it used, I know one thing that I know is that uh, while it uses a framework for streaming, it is not using it entirely correctly. And I think I've seen, I don't think patches for that have gone in yet. It's a bit of a shame, I think, because UVC is used so often. But I have a different driver, which is a test drive, where we'll show that later. This is what it should look like. So now it's doing various uh, streaming tests and no failures. And a quick, I did a, so with power grind, it's actually uh, UC minus C. So you can actually see, this is the output of power grind. You can actually see here that it's, apparently this is a new call. Uh, no, it's not quite true, but apparently it's not initializing something correctly. I need to look at that. So this is, this is perfect for testing your application. Did I miss something? Two other utilities. So that was the compliance test that takes care of drives. So you make a new driver, run this. When you start developing the driver, run this as often as you can because it will keep you at on track. Make sure, and just go through the failures from top to bottom. Just process them one by one. It's the best way of doing it. Um, on the application side, you have two utilities. These are golden reference utilities. We keep them up to date. So we add new APIs. We add support for that to these utilities as well. Uh, also, these utilities are intended to show you best practices. It's not necessarily best code, I have to admit. It could be better, but it's really trying hard to <coughs> deal with all the subtleties that you can get with uh, the studio driver. As I said, kept in sync. And this is command line, so it's ideal for testing things and embedded systems. And this is ideal for interactive testing. So a few quick things here. So Pro 2, it has a, no, let me do that on this one. If you look at all the messages, uh, it uh, has a lot of options. 
we go. We go, as I said, there are something like 80 whatever IOPTOs at the moment, and they all have to be implemented with lots of options. So the good thing, but that's the bad thing, the good thing, it's, it's all there. So you can really get exactly and do exactly what you want to do. Uh, what is very nice is that you have streaming support. And let me see if I can stream. So this is streaming from the webcam. By default, the what it captures is just thrown away. But you can write it to a file. You can write it to the standard output and pipe it to another process. So you quite a few options. Um, if you're working on an embedded system <coughs> and you have video output that is controlled by VDS for Linux, then this also has a pattern generator. It's built in. I uh, will talk a bit more about that later, but that comes with, uh, with the utility. So it's ideal for you know, outputting color bars, stuff like that. It's, uh, it's very nice. Do feel for all two. Um, uh, So this is uh, a nice GUI tool uh, with UVC. So hey, uh, you can control things. Uh, so all these controls are all there. So you have uh, brightness and, and you can play around with that. So this is easier than a command line tool where you know the video is just thrown away. Here, at least, you it's probably a bit scary to see that, but uh, this is a little more interactive. And if your uh, your hardware can do that, you have a screen hooked up and you can render it, then that's much nicer. Okay, so far so good. Now we come to the next bit where, okay, I have this nice fancy application and I want to test it. What do most application developers do? They have uh, this webcam and they have perhaps one or two other devices and that's all they test on. There is a huge range of video devices with all very different capabilities. So it is very difficult for your average application developer to test whether you can handle different devices. And this is where these test drivers came in. Uh, we have two main ones. Uh, one is for memory to memory test drivers. And I'm not really going to discuss that. If you want to test things like that, then it's here. Uh, but the really big one for most people is Vivid. It's a replacement of an old PP driver, virtual video that we had before that was very limited and was actually not according to the specs what it was doing. So that made it fairly useless for application testing. Uh, I if I remember correctly, if you would use this as input for Skype, you would get sort of a very narrow window. Uh, Skype would com get completely confused. My understanding is that the video for Linux code in Skype is terrible anyway, but combine it with a bad driver and it's hopeless. But Vivid is basically trying to do emulate almost everything except for really complicated memory-to-memory -memory devices or, or uh, big complex topologies. When it comes to standard video and output, it's all working. So we have video capture, video output can be done. Vertical blanking capture and output is there. Uh, radio receiving and transmitting. Radio is part of video for Linux. It's basically video capture without the video part, it's just the audio. But you need a tuner and the tuner support was there already. That's why it's in here. Uh, software defined radio, that's fairly new. So that's also emulated these days. And it is a lot of attention went into emulating what real hardware does. So all the quirks that real hardware has, they're all emulated here. Um, without a driver like that, it is next to impossible to verify that your application works with everything. Because you simply do not have the hardware, unless you spend, like me, years collecting hardware and buying it and getting it. You're uh, scrounging eBay for nice new stuff. But most people don't do that. They're not that crazy. So they just have a few webcams or whatever. That's all they test with. And that's not enough. You, you're not able to make a good, uh, good application for that. 
So, let me set this up correctly. I just, I ran before, I ran the compliance test on this driver and it leaves it in an inconsistent state. Or at least not a state I want to use. <laughs> so I need to reload it. Okay. So you can see that this uh, two view for a two, uh, suddenly this is getting a, a much bigger screen. That's because there are a huge number of, uh, of features. Of course you have the input and as you can see here, we support uh, webcam, standard webcam. We have a TV tuner, emulation, uh, S-Studio input, and HDMI. And for webcams, we have support for different sizes. And as a, as a typical webcam, if you, if you look at the frame size here, 30 frames per second, that if you go to the highest, it goes drops down to 15. Because that's, you know, normal webcams are limited by the bandwidth. So you either have a large resolution or low <coughs> rate, or vice versa. So again, this is this is one of the little things where it's emulating what actual hardware is doing. <coughs> uh, supports lots of different feet, uh, uh, formats, basically all the standard formats that typical applications have, or typical drivers have, they're all uh, available here. Uh, 420, why is this 420? That's the only one that it doesn't emulate, because that it would be doable, but it weird format, it looks tricky, so we didn't do that. Um, uh, pixel aspect ratios, uh, this is of course more interested for TV, where you get all the different, uh, well for webcams the, as the pixel is always square, but for TV they're actually not square, so you can select whatever it, uh, it has to be there. Color space conver uh, support. I'm not going to talk about color space now. That's my next presentation. And then you will hear a lot more ab about color, much more probably than you ever want to know. Uh, various streaming methods that are supported by the driver. How many buses do you want? And if it's supported, you can even do cropping and composing in a fairly intuitive way. So what do you get normally? Well, uh, let me pick one size bigger than this one. So when you start running, uh, it is capturing from the virtual driver. Uh, that virtual driver visit is giving you this pattern. So by default, it's just a color bar. Uh, you get some uh, on-screen text with timing and, and sequence numbers. Fairly simple. If you look uh, look at these tabs, so tabs with control in the name, they just show the controls exposed by the driver. Or it means in practice, uh, let me get back. So you have uh, the typical brightness, uh, contrast, saturation here. And just for fun, they actually work. Uh, I admit I was a little bit crazy to do that, but uh, it was fun to make. Um, you also see lots of controls here, control types. These represent all the possible control types. So that's great for testing your application, because you can use this to check whether the application can actually understand all those types. Uh, normal drivers, they will just have one or two or three types and never all of them. So you would without, if you just use hardware, you can never do this. Uh, and then the final step, again, these are controls. So they're exposed by the visit driver. But these are all controls that affect the way the visit driver is um, exposing itself, uh, is advertising itself to your application. So we have test patterns here. There's a go through them. You can, you can see all the various uh, primary colors that you can have, scatter, uh, scatter boards, uh, lots of different, including a noisy pattern, a, a gray ramp. 
So you can try various input and uh, various patterns to see how they work. Uh, this is doing the on-screen display, what do you want there? You can actually have movement. Uh, you know, when you have a static pattern, it can be difficult to see when you send it out to somewhere, it can be difficult to see whether you're just seeing the last frame and everything is stalled or whether it's actually still texting. Having some movement makes it much easier. Uh, you can have a border around the picture that allows you to check whether you do any clipping somewhere. Uh, it's also very useful, and I will come to that later, if you have pillar boxing or um, uh, letter boxing, then the border goes around the actual video, the actual video part. And if you want to clip the, the letter boxing or pillar boxing, then it's good to see that you're not clipping too much. You can show a square. Now, what you can sadly, uh, while it is square on my laptop, clearly these pixels are not square. Uh, but, you know, if you're using it in an application, you can actually use that to check that your pixel aspect ratio and pixel handling is actually correct. I, and quite often you get a circle there, but I find that a circle is really difficult to measure, whether it's a pure circle or an oval. With a square, you can just put a ruler on your screen and see, okay, so many centimeters width, and that's the height. Hey, it's good. Uh, so the, the Vivid Drive will actually take into account if it's generating pixels that are not square, then this, in the if you if you would display that picture with square pixels, this wouldn't be square anymore. It's really the end result of this should be square. Uh, now, what is clearly missing in this application is a way of testing what the pixel aspect ratio is of my output device. It assumes that it's square, and if you have a setup like this, it clearly isn't. I'm actually not sure if it's if a uh, what do you call it? Projector like that can give you correct pixel aspect information. I know it can be done through the EDID, but whether it's actually reality? Yeah, you get a fixed physical size and you know your resolution, so you can calculate the pixel. If you have, usually with LCDs and uh, laptop screens and stuff like that, you get correct information that the projector, sadly, you can look at my laptop, it's square here. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, I'll show a bit more later. You can actually turn on whether cropping, composing, or scaling is supported in this driver because in track there are basically independent features of studio hardware, so you can get it in all combinations. So in order to make this useful, you can actually say, okay, this, this Vivid Driver says that it can crop, but it cannot scale and it cannot compose. So you have lots of features, lots of options there. Um, let me move this around a little bit. You can choose to just fill a percentage of your screen. I mean, these, these frames are all generated by the CPU, okay? It's a virtual drive, it's not real hardware, so it's all generated. You have a really big resolution and your CPU is not that powerful. So you can choose to just generate the top X percent of your frame to prevent your CPU from going uh, way too high. Um, some interesting things you can, uh, drop a certain percentage of buffers. Clearly, I should have moved, got rid of the square. So what can your application handle it if 10% of your buffers are dropped? Uh, you can, uh, I'm not going to do that now, but you can emulate your USB disconnect as if someone would just pull out the plug. So nothing works anymore. And actually the way this is done in the driver is identical how a true USB device would work. Uh, you can uh, inject uh, errors, so you can, in video for Linux, can give you a buffer, but with a flag saying that the content of this buffer is probably corrupt. Uh, does your application handle that? It's very difficult to do in a real hardware, because most hardware doesn't do that, it's always correct. But some hardware, 
can do that in certain circumstances. So that can be next to impossible to reproduce in the reality. But you still want to make sure your application can handle this. And then there are a bunch of, uh, of other errors, internal errors that can occur uh, that, again, normally almost never happen. But this way you can trigger it and see what, uh, what is going on. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting. So we also, uh, I also added support, so that was webcam support. So we also have uh, TV. Uh, let me go with a less annoying pattern. So this is, uh, this is emulating a TV tuner. It is uh, PAL format by default, and you can, you have a frequency here. Uh, let me get rid of the border. So, okay, I, I, I admit I have too much time on my hands, so if you move the frequency a little bit out, then, it's, uh, then the color filler kicks in. And if you go a little bit further, ah, you no more signal. And even, again, too much time, if you make small changes to the frequency, you see the pattern changing slightly as well. I, I admit it has no useful property at all, but it was so simple to do, and I had so much fun. <laughs> so it, uh, let's go back to uh, proper color. I, did, I, I had a lot of fun doing this, at least with the best of thanks. But also, this is a good example of uh, <coughs> the effort I put into keeping everything here. It's easiest to see with uh, magnifying. So you can see that uh, the top line, or to be precise, the top half line, has crap in it. Do people know why that is? Yeah, white screen signal. So this is, I don't know who came up with that stupid idea, but uh, for Paul, uh, they decided that it would be fun, you need signaling, whether it's uh, four by three or white screen. Let's put it in the top half line, just for kicks. So if you have a, a PAL system, and you don't get it with NTSC, so it's just PAL and SECOM, then, and you just capture the whole frame, and then you show it back on an uh, on LCD screen, and quite often, if it's done badly, you see this wiggly stuff going on at the top. So that's reproduced. Uh, actually, not not quite 100 percent, because it's not a real white screen signal. I, I could do that as well if I really wanted, but that went a bit too far. But this is useful to check again: does your application, if it if it gets an input like this, can it handle it? And what what you probably want to do here is just to crop the top line of black, make it black or whatever. Um, also, yeah, this difficult again, difficult to see. Uh, if it wasn't for the projector, this would be square. Even though, if you, uh, if I can, and no, if I represent the picture as traditional four by three. doing this right. Uh, so sometimes so many features that I get confused. Uh, no, it's from a picture aspect ratio. Right. Yeah, again, it's difficult, but you saw the, the square changing. So this is when what happens when you show the picture with, where you interpret the pixels as being square. Uh, let me see if I can Very carefully. So this is my so now you can see that the square is actually not square anymore. So I turned off the compensation for the fact that what I'm receiving from the driver has non-square pixels. And by default, QVFRAL2 will detect that and will compensate, scale, set up the scaler correctly in the GPU so that it looks properly square again. So this is a, an excellent way of again testing your application. 
stand up, I hope. Yeah, there you go. What are you doing? Ask him correctly. And finally, we have HDMI. So is going to see. Uh, by the way, one thing that I wanted to tell you. You can select all these uh, these formats here. And actually, all the, the, the frame rates that you see there, they are reproduced exactly. So again, I put a lot of effort. So if you have 59.94 hertz, you will actually get 59.94 hertz and not 60. Uh, the way the generator works internally is that it really is very precise. So it's you may get up to one zipper, um, but it's but well zipper or one one jiffy up to one jiffy jitter, but no more than that. So over the long term, it will be exact. So this allows you also to test differences between 59.94 and 60 and the stuff like that. Uh, I spend a lot of time and effort into that, and it's really, uh, really cool. And as you can see, this goes up to uh, the very uh, latest 4K. So if you want to test with, well, let's, this is actually the LCD. Usually most PCs go for, for that one. So... Okay. And this is really, I mean, it, this is generating 4K pictures. That is then really scaled down to 10, 24, 7, uh, 68. But you do get it generating 4K, and it can do this at 50 frames per second, which I think is, first of all, pretty amazing from the CPU doing that at that speed. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you've hooked up a real 4K screen, then you can just use this as you would. If you don't need to, if, if you're, it's ideal for prototyping as well. You don't have a camera yet that can do it. You can use this as a replacement. Check whether your application can handle it. It, uh, as again, I put in a lot of effort to make this a great way of checking that everything you do is working. The Vivid driver is also very configurable. So by default, you get uh, camera input and streamer and HDMI input, but you can configure all the inputs and outputs and how many you have and uh, what they look like. So you can actually use this to prototype your hardware. You don't have the hardware yet. You have, you know, my embedded system is going to look like this <coughs> with so many inputs and so many outputs, and you can just configure Vivid to emulate that. So that's again ideal for doing early testing not a coincidence that it's doing that um, it can get very confusing if you have uh, if you want to do things like this with cropping and scaling and composing uh, then you have an OpenGL that is doing scaling and composing or whatever again so if you have a complicated test sequence, you sometimes really need to think hard about how things work together. Uh, I'm running out of time. So resources, uh, of course, we have the, the API. Internal frameworks are documented here. Uh, there's one framework that really should be here as well, but uh, currently you the best bet is to use the header. It's pretty good, really well documented. Um, Vivid driver, it went in in kernel 3.18, but uh, you can also get it here, of course. Uh, a skeleton driver is available here. It's specifically for PCI, but it's fairly good base for any driver that you need. Um, there's one missing. Oh, I should have added that here. There is in documentation, documentation tool of Linux, there is a vivid.tech that 
goes into excruciating detail about as to all the features that are in Visit. I mean, I, I have only shown, well, these are the most important bits, but it's probably 60% of what it drives that I will talk about. So there's a lot more there, and if you want to use it, then that documentation is uh, quite extensive. Questions about this? The visit drive is an order. Re yeah, the visit drive is an internal driver of the kernel. That's correct. Um, could you do this in user space? Uh, well, actually, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Probably not. Mostly because of all the DNA. Well, it's not really DNA. It would be weird. It's much easier to do it as a driver. Uh, it's actually very efficient. So, for example, generating those test patterns uh, is just a man copy. Uh, it's the, the every pattern is equally efficient as every other, and a lot of time is spent in making it really good. The problem with user space is, first of all, it's much diff much more difficult for us to keep the visit drive in sync with the latest APIs because then you have to deal with the user space component and using that component with an older driver, what will you do then? So just having it as a driver, because it, it actually wants to represent hardware, so it's good that it acts exactly the same, and that you don't have additional weird stuff going on. Uh, we always had these virtual drivers in the past, and it's, it's actually very useful. Uh, I saw a question there. What, what kind of unit uh, framework, test framework did I use? Uh, my own. Uh, it's really, all it does is, is basically, uh, it has a few little functions uh, and it keeps on counters of the number of failures and it just, you know, if it fails, and I also, if it fails, I just return. I'm not going to try to compensate for it. There should be no failures. So if I encounter a failure, then, well, I just give up, basically. Fix it and then we can go on to the next. So sometimes you have early failures that will generate lots of later failures. I don't care about that. You shouldn't have failures in the first place. Just fix from the top to the bottom and make it work. What are the memory requirements of the visit driver? Um, fairly low, actually. Those you would expect, well, one thing that will take, if you want to use it with uh, 20 buffers, for 4K frames, then you will need 20 buffers of 4K memory, but you know that speaks for itself. That's your decision as application developer. The driver itself, to do its test pattern, it, uh, it just generates, uh, it needs buffers that are twice the width of what you want to capture, and I think it's up to eight of those, that's all. So it, it, it is done really efficiently. So it doesn't need to create full frames in memory at all. So bottom line is very little. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, so the all those tests. Uh, which one? Oh no. The rest is all generic. So the vivid, the vivid controls tab that you see that is g given by the vivid driver, they ha basically have all to do with how how do you change the behavior of vivid and some error injection. Obviously, that's all specific to the vivid driver. A normal driver will just show what the hardware does. That's all that it gives you. But as I said, as application developer, you just have a limited set of hardware, so you you're limited to what that hardware gives you, and this is almost physically everything. Any other questions? Okay, well if you're interested in color spaces, because I've been ignoring that in this presentation, normally I say a few things about it, then just sit tight and in uh, 15 minutes we continue with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>